Well, I like the informal discussion type of approach. It seems to me that on occasion like this, questions are something of infinitely more value than a lecture or a story. But Rip suggested that I make some remarks here tonight, and I'm only too glad to do that. I'm coming down on the plane. I got speculating with myself about the early days of the AA and about the, uh, the meaning of them in terms of the grace of God. Uh, I've read somewhere that it's a grain of wheat which has been stored for centuries in a dry place is exposed to the right soil and the right climate and to enough light from above. It will manifest life and it will unfold and it will grow. But this presupposes the right soil, the right climate, and above all, a much light. Well, I think it's that way with AA. I remember years back to when we first began to get publicity. And the first very large occasion was the huge team down in the Saturday Evening Post, which all at once produced us about 6,000 members. This was in 41, and by then, a number of medics had become close friends, some of them psychiatrists. And these fellows allowed their names to be used, a rather audacious step in those days, I assure you. Your names were used in a post article. I make this point because the, when later asked to testify on another occasion, they refused to do it. And these were the circumstances. The first gal that got sober in AA is one known to many of you as Marty. You're very much of a growing concern in the education field. Marty was a most difficult case. God knows we're all complex, but Marty was really a champ. And she had been under the care of a Dr. Foster Kennedy a man of very wide repute in that time, or wide renowned, a neurologist. And he watched Marty as she was planted in the new soil. He watched her receive this light. Well, he was tremendously impressed. He came to some meetings, and soon he said to me, Bill, would it be possible to have two or three of um, the psychiatrists uh, in institutions who have seen recovery, the very grim cases, people that you say are friends of yours and who have testified for you in the post case, couldn't we get a group of this sort to come to the Academy of Medicine and explain what they have seen? Well, we thought this was just great, because in those days there were a few friends indeed. So shown by these people, <laughs> by reason of Dr. Kennedy, well, uh, what to be done? So one by one, we went to them, and we said, would they come to the academy? And we supposed they would. 
after all, some of the Kennedy boys had brushed their options. You know, they were friends anyhow, and they proved it, so why not? And not a one would do it. And when pressed for their reasons for not doing it, each one of them separately said the same thing. In effect, each said, look, Bill, you folks have added up to in one column more of the resources which have been separately applied to alcoholics than anyone else. For example, you have this kinship in suffering. You have possibilities of communication that others don't have. You have a crude form of self-examination or analysis and our society. You have uh, a great new outgoing interest. You reduce guilt by restitution. And you have this great compelling interest in helping others. And then there is a religious fact. And then there is this fact of the hopelessness. So far as the resources of the individual are concerned, of this mountain. Now, this is a formidable list of fortunes. But we still can't come to the academy. Well, why not? Well, said they, we see in AA sometimes in weeks, in a few months, shifts in motivation that even the sum of these forces couldn't begin to account for because we all too well understand the difficulties of this country to settle some touch. And the sum of them won't add up to the speed of these transformations in the very good cases. So for us, there is an unknown factor at work in AA. And among ourselves, being scientists, we call it the X factor. We believe you people call it the great design. And who shall go to the academy to explain the great design to that point? No one can. And we simply aren't wrong. So, I think it is just as futile as ever for any of us to presume to explain this matter of grace around which our entire galaxy of principles and activities gathers. We can't do that, but we can examine this matter of the thought and this matter of fun and this matter of illumination, which for some reason or other, we have made ourselves ready. Clearly, God's grace is in and through all. So, it might be said, why have an alcoholic sober <laughs> many times more often through grace than they have? It's available. Why has religion been more successful numerically at least? Why has this medicine been? How is it that laymen 
seem to be doing this stuff. So I would like to tell a story depicting, at least as it seems to me, what the style is, and what the climate is, and what the life is. These things of which we have been placed in such treasured possession. There is no doubt that in an ordinary sense of time, A began in the office of a psychiatrist. And we might be mindful of this when we criticize people in this profession. Of course, for most of us, the origin is 2,000 years ago. For some of us, perhaps older. But I'm speaking of the situation in an immediate sense. How was it precipitated? This, too, is a matter of conjecture. But here's how it seems to me. There was a certain businessman of great attainment. He's cut down by the grog. He runs the gamut of treatments in this country. And this would be in the year about 1932, when he was just about at the end of his tether. <coughs> So he went abroad and became a patient of Dr. Carl Jung. And as all of you know, Jung was one of the founding fathers of the art, I prefer that instead of science, of the class. And Jung, Adler, Freud, were the three founding fathers, but of these, only you seem to think that man is something more than two dollars worth of chemicals, a bundle of instincts, and an uncertain intellect. Young said. Man has something beyond this. What man has thought. So, <coughs> our traveler has found a truly great human being. Great indeed, as events fell out. He placed himself under that dear man's tutelage for a whole year, becoming more and more confident that the hidden springs of this baleful compulsion to drink were being understood and removed and cast away. He began to feel more free. There was no drinking while he was under treatment. At the end of the year, he left Carl Jung, and in one month, he was tight. <coughs> and the bender was terrific. So, in infinite despair, he came back to Carl Jung and said, Is there anything now for me? You were my course of last resort. And this great man said, Rowan, I thought for a time after you first came, that you might be one of those rare cases 
in which my art has been comfortable. Otherwise, I should not have incurred the stress. <coughs> but alas, I'm obliged to conclude that you are not, and that there is nothing that I have to offer you. My art has failed you. I need not say that coming from a man of his eminence, this was a statement of beautiful to know. And the whole destiny of they you and me, and all of us, has spent on, on that fence. So then has it found that agony was added to this day. And he cried out, But is there nothing? And this was the answer he got. Rowan, time out of mind, alcoholic, and recovery. Here and there, now and then, through religious experiences, spiritual experiences, let us say, or very truly through conversion. And not a word for our days, we don't use it for obvious reasons. But, said the doctor, this benign lightning seldom strikes. And no one can say where or when it will, or for the resuscitation of food. So I simply would advise you to place yourself in a religious atmosphere remembering the hopelessness of your doing anything about it on your own remaining resources alone and cooperating with your associates and casting yourself upon whatever God their name be. So Roland Align himself with the Oxford roots of that time, a rather evangelical movement, rather aggressive, very easy it is to criticize. It was non denominational, however, and it used simple common denominators of religion. Simple moral principles. It called upon its members to admit that they could not solve the life problem on their own. It called upon them for self examination. It called upon them for restitution. It called upon them for a kind of giving in the Franciscan manner, the kind of giving that demands no return in money, power, prestige, and the like. The losing of one's self and life of others. Such was the nature of the crowd with which he became associated. Unaccountable to him, the obsession to drink left. And for some years, he had no more trouble. At the time in the groups, there were a few alcoholics sober. There is one now at Ann Arbor that goes back to that time. 
an old friend who never became an AA. Suffered up in the oxygen group. So Rowan returned to America, and the groups here in those days were headed by an Episcopal clergyman called Sam Schumacher. And in the, his congregation and among the groups were two or three other alcoholics that for the nonce were in the same guy. And uh, Hazard had a summer place near Bangton, Vermont. And these friends, one of them son of a local judge, and himself an alcoholic, described the plight of a boy who was a school <coughs> time chum of mine, Abby Thatcher. And Abby had been deteriorating horribly. There were summer folks in the town of Barton, Manchester. Abby had run his car into the side of the farmer's house pushed the wall of the kitchen in. The door would, would still be open to the car. Abby stuck his head out into the poor woman carrying in the corner who hadn't been hit. He said, hey, what about a cup of coffee? <laughs> well, the town fathers had had it. They were going to commit Abby for alcoholic insanity. So the judge's son and Hazard picked up the man who was to become my sponsor. Meanwhile, I had gone the route with which you're all familiar. I had sobered up the summer before, scared to death by the verdict of my doctor, Dr. Silkwood the one we had since named the little doctor who loved drunks, and he must have been because in his lifetime he dealt with some 40,000 of them, as a hack doctor in a drying out place. And he had an idea that this thing was an illness, having several components, a spiritual illness, a moral illness, and also a physical illness. And perhaps oversimplifying, he was asked to describe an alcoholic as a person condemned by a compulsion to drink against his own interests, to drink in spite of his perfect willingness to stop, and that uh, this drinking was coupled to an increasing sensitivity to the body, which, if the drinking went on, guaranteed his insanity and one day his death. So this sort of a sentence had been spoken to Lois at long last by my doctor, Dr. Silkwood. So, you see, the so, there uh, was under separation. We were beginning to learn a little more about time. Abby and my other friend, Rowan, had received a considerable amount of light. When I got drunk, in about two months, even in spite of his sentence, that I would have to be locked up, although nuts, maybe within a year. And then my friend Abby, who had been brought to New York from Vermont, who had unaccountably sobered up for the time being in the access group, came to visit me. But I, too, was in great despair. Despair is a primary ingredient, indeed, of this thought. In the medical 
jargon, we might call it deflation of debt. Some deflation, huh? So, it became the scene. And he fixed his name, this list of moral, you might say, cliches. Nothing so new about that. I was in favor of honesty. I was in favor of helping other people. I was in favor of practically everything he had to say, except one thing. I was not in favor of God. For I had received one of these magnificent modern, modern schooling, scientific schooling, that assured me. Then by a series of stages, picking up influence from somewhere, as they went along, I could be traced back to a single piece of ooze in prehistoric seas. And this was my faith. And science was my job. <coughs> So along comes Abby. And along comes Jung, for whom I had respect. And here was my reaction. Science can't do it. Medicine can't do it. Psychology can't do it. Religion, sometimes. That was important. But how could I? <laughs> so I felt trapped. In other words, I was good in the trap which we every day construct for the drunk who approaches us. <laughs> Saying, well, I think the group wise must be great helping other people on forth, but I couldn't get the spiritual angle as I said. Now, as you know, this gentleman is a newcomer, like me, is being caught in this trap. When you and I talk to another alcoholic and we identify ourselves as having been denizens of this strange world and having emerged, and we describe this malady in the terms of our God science, and that God pronounces the sense of hopelessness on us, the sentence. We are deflated at death. And then we learn that now we have accepted our personal hopelessness. There still isn't any hope because we cannot go to the Godhead. And this was the awful dilemma into which I was cast by my friend Eddie, bringing on the one side all of the sad news, but on the other side, the spectacle of his own release. And that was the word to you. He couldn't say he was on the waterway. The obsession had just left him. As soon as he became worse, to trust on the basis of these principles. And indeed, as he became really to appeal to whatever God there might be. And this was reducing the theological requirements an awful lot. Well, I went on drinking about three weeks, and in no waking hour could I forget the face of my friend, a textual release as I looked out through a haze of gin into his face and he pitched with synthesis at me. A conversion experience is not for me. 
I am an absolute Ramada. Besides, I can't, I can't fast. People say to me, have faith, and I believe I'd have faith if I could have it, but I can't. But anyhow, I'll go and get dried up. So I went to the hunt. I must have had a little optimism because I came in with a bag of beer. I tried to share it on the subway up. I was waving a bottle. Where those glasses of silkworth came out. And I yelled at him this time, Doc, I got it. He said, I'm afraid you had, Bill. You better get upstairs and go to bed. <laughs> and he looked very sad. So he loved me. So I went upstairs and went to bed. I was there a while ahead of the DTs. So. In about three days, I was all in the clear. But the more sober I got, the more awful the despair, the depression. So I think it was the morning of the third and fourth day that my friend Abby showed up in the doorway. And my feeling was ambivalent at once. So I said, well, this is the time he's going to pour on the evangelist. And on the other hand, I was saying, well, he should be looking for a job. Why is he up here at 11 o'clock in the morning to see me? He does practice what he preaches. So, Abby knew my prejudices. So he waited for me to ask him again for that neat little formula to which he had achieved relief. And dutifully he went through and to go on to yourself with another person in confidence who made restitution to help others, and you prayed to God as you understood it. I think he might have even used that phrase. And without much more ado, he was gone. No question. And again, I couldn't have trust the conscience. And again, the despair deep. Until the last of this prideful obstinacy, momentarily, was apparently crushed off. And then, like a child crying out in the dark, I said, if there is a father, if there is a God, will he show himself? And the place lit up in a great glare. A wonderful light. Life. And then I began to have images in the mind's eye, so to speak. And one came in which I seemed to see myself standing on a mountain. And a great clean wind was blowing. And this blowing at first went around, and then it seemed to go through. And then the ecstasy redoubled, and I found myself exclaiming, I am free man. So this is the God of the creatures. And little by little, the ecstasy subsided, and I found myself in a new world of consciousness. And one of the early reflections in this world of great peace that stole over me was that all is well and is gone. I am a part of his cosmos at play. Even evil in his hands can be transmitted into growth. For 
all had been destroyed and destroyed. By a fellow suffering. So we use the scientific verdicts to the great man. We use his ability to communicate to me through our kinship of common suffering. And who made the sense of a person who practiced for the person? So then, to me, here indeed, was the thought. Here was fun. And God knows the life is great. Now, I venture this assertion is possible of AA. And a spiritual awakening or experience of exactly the stuff. Certainly it is not for me to differ with theologians, but let me say I could first say that there is no essential difference between what happened to me and what happened to each sound I had, except in the time element. Going back to those cards who said we can understand this tremendous shift in motivation despite all your resources. Well, in my case, the shift, but the boots have been the same. And one of the most terrible compulsions and obsessions known has been expelled from us almost wholesale through this happy sense of medicine, religion, and our own experience in suffering in the covers and sharing the grace of this one with the next. So far, there's my speech. <laughs> Instant conviction 
of the presence of God, which has never left me from that moment, in spite of the worst I can do, and it's often been damned bad. And no matter what question. And I feel that that extra good thing may have made the difference whether I would have persisted with AA in the early years or not. Actually, it makes them liabilities, and I've seen it in others who have had these experiences in AA, and that's quite a lot. And this is a tendency. And I think you feel of, give us some excuse for it, too, of uh, beginning to think that because we have these tremendous illumination, that we are something special. So you begin to develop a kind of a paranoia alongside of a perfectly valid experience. And this is just what happens to me. I then near botched up the whole one by coming out of this, working seriously with John, and before anybody had been sobered up, I got so far off base as to loudly declare one time to an audience by no means fell down that I was going to sober up all the goddamn drunks in the world. <laughs> now that is still paranoia, if you will. <laughs> so, uh, uh, don't long for the illumination. Uh, I think you have to have the experiences appropriate. Well, some people do, you know. Oh, my God, if I could only have one line to go. <laughs> now, actually, this is maybe said very sincerely because this may be guy slipping around. But he may be slipping around on account of the fact that he's a little spooky and needs some of them driving and be free. So now we're put on hot. <laughs> 